during the next six hours, at least 12 specific prophecies were fulfilled. He poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. They crucified two thieves with him, one on his right and one on his left. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Those who pass by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. That was, again, typical of Romans. Uh, you strip the guy's clothes off and put him on the cross, and so any of the clothing that was yet considered of any value at all, uh, they would gamble for. Uh, so here are the soldiers gambling at the foot of the cross to see who gets the robe of Jesus, and that's predicted in Psalm 22, a thousand years before the time of Christ, uh, that they have encircled me, uh, that they're taunting me, and in all of that, all of the prophecies, of Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 are fulfilled in minute detail in the death of Jesus Christ. At noon, the sixth hour by Jewish reckoning, the divine judgment of God echoed over Jerusalem through the forces of the natural world. In that day, declares the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. As the skies darkened and the temperature dropped, Jesus, nearly dead from loss of blood, summoned his last reserve of strength to call out to God as messianic prophecy again came to fruition. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Back in those days, the Psalms were not numbered. And so the way in which you referred to them was to recite the first line. Well, what is Psalm 22? It's a messianic psalm. It has uh, predictions about the coming of the Messiah. And he was, in effect, there on the cross, applying that to himself, saying, Psalm 22 is coming true in me today. My strength is dried up, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. They gave me vinegar for my thirst. Later, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and lifted it up to his lips. After sipping the bitter wine, Jesus uttered his final words, again, in fulfillment of prophecy. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Thousands of men were crucified, but there was only one man who was God, who was crucified. He was taking the sin that we should have taken upon ourselves, upon himself at that moment, bearing the full sin of the world.
At that moment, the earth shook and rocks split. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. In crucifixion, it is basically a slow death by asphyxiation. You are unable to um, breathe properly and you ultimately suffocate. And so to hasten death on the cross, Romans would typically take a heavy mallet and shatter the shin bones of the victims of crucifixion so they could no longer push up on the cross and breathe properly. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. By the time he came to Jesus, Jesus already gave his spirit to the Lord because he was in total control. You see, no one could take it away from him, so he controlled every single uh, second on the cross, and it was just at the perfect time when the Passover lamb is going to be sacrificed at about three to four o'clock in the afternoon that when he gave his life. And Yeshua has predicted that, and indeed, it came to pass. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, and wrapped it in accordance with Jewish burial customs. Near the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb cut out of rock in which no one had ever been laid. They placed Jesus there, and then rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Through the influence of Joseph of Arimathea, a man of wealth and a follower of Christ, the final prophecy of the Passion was fulfilled. And they made his grave with the rich at his death. I think that we have to look at the Passion of the Christ through the lens of these prophecies. This is more than just a story about someone who comes and dies and claims to be the Son of God and the Messiah. It is a fulfillment of these prophecies against all mathematical odds in a miraculous way that validates the claim of Jesus Christ to be who he claimed to be. God, in a sense, created a fingerprint. He said, I'm going to provide predictions. Whoever fulfills these predictions, you will know he is the Messiah who has come to save Israel and the world. These are very specific uh, details that are given in the Old Testament that are fulfilled in the New Testament. Because I think when you see the prophecy and then you see the exact fulfillment in the New Testament, it all fits together perfectly.